Subhanallah. How can some people who have been systematically traumatized, their dignity ripped out of them, ripped out of them, they are traumatized. They don't know who they are. They don't know where they are. Just for a moment, Muslims, take the time tonight or tomorrow, you and your children, if you dare and if you care, study what has happened to these people. Study what has happened to them and you will cry. If you have any feeling inside of you as a Muslim, you will cry. You will hang your head down and you will say to yourself, do I really deserve to be here in these people's place? Minimally, we Muslims here in this country, it should be our job to try and go to those aboriginal people and offer Islam to them because Islam may be the only thing that will bring them back from the trauma what has been done to them. And I believe that Allah is just and Islam is just and Islam brought us here to introduce justice. How? In the form of da'wah. Because Islam have visited other places and Muslims have visited other places in worse conditions than Australia and the aboriginals. And it brought justice and it brought light and it brought inspiration. I remind you Muslims that some Muslims went to Indonesia. Some Muslim merchants went to Indonesia. And Indonesia, they were worshiping stones. They were filthy people, backwards people, oppressed people in the clutches of the Catholic Church. Confused, ignorant people who also had been oppressed and depressed and displaced. And some Muslim merchants went there and gave them da'wah. No Muslim army entered Indonesia. Only Muslims, merchants, doctors, engineers, people who were doing well and who were, had the feeling to give da'wah. And so what is the history today? What is Indonesia today? Your neighbor, your neighbor, who is every now and then flexing their muscles in this area. They are the largest Muslim state in the world. The largest population of Muslims in the world. This is a mu'jizah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A mu'jizah, a phenomena. Yes, they have their problems. But at least they have Islam. Now here in Australia, the systematic destabilization of the Aborigines, 16 million of them. This was an act of inflicting systematic attacks and assaults upon individuals and places within human populations with the purpose of instilling fear and trauma and criminal occupation. What is the definition of that? Terrorism. We can go on and on. We're don't only talking about the last 200 years based upon the definition of Funk and Wagner Webster's and Oxford. Their own definition is not Khalid's definition. We can go to the land of India where many of you find your roots. We can go to the land of China, not far from us. And between India and China, 
more than 86 million people have been systematically destabilized, liquefied, murdered, replaced in the same way through the act of inflicting systematic attacks and assaults upon individuals and places within human populations with the purpose of instilling fear and trauma. And what is that definition? And the Caribbean, and the Pacific Islands, and the Inquisition of Spain and Portugal, the South Sea Islands, and the Far East by the British, by the Americans, the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, by the Spanish. In fact, this definition given by Oxford and Webster and Funken Wagner, the authorities in the English language, this definition, this technique, which is defined as what? Terrorism. This has been the historical choice, the historical methodology, and the preferred way of destabilizing and occupying foreign nations for the last 200 years, and no one ever called it terrorism. The United Nations, that was before called the League of Nations. Did you know that? They never defined any of these actions, any of these barbaric, tragic intrusions, criminal occupations, destabilizations, murder, and protracted crimes on humanity. They never called it what? Terrorism. Now let's go to the issue of, before we go to the issue of the suicide bombers and the freedom fighters who are called fanatics and extremists, let's first add up this, uh, what has happened in the last 20 years. Did anybody keep count with me? Excuse me. How many? 487 million. That's half a billion people. I didn't say in jail. I didn't say oppressed. I said totally destabilized, eliminated, slaughtered, liquefied, or otherwise eradicated over a period of 200 years. Now that crime will be paid for because Allah is just. And that crime is being paid for. That crime is being paid for. In the Western world, which we are living, which has the highest standard of living, which is the most advanced, which has the highest level of education, which has the highest buildings, the most institutions, the most enjoyment, the most developed technology, the most preferred way of life, the most beautiful houses, the most diversified marketplaces, the Western world, the pearl of the earth where everybody is being called to, the Western world. Let me give you some statistics to show you how they are paying for it. The Western world that we're living in Every single hour, every single hour, 106 children are aborted. That means they are murdered. 106 children are aborted every single hour, which means every two hours, every three hours, some 350 children are killed in the womb in the Western world. Every hour. 106. Every 24 hours, 
Nearly 3,000. Every week, 21,000. Every month, 85,000. Every year, 1.3 million children are killed in the womb, little people. And the Western world, at any given time, has 2.8 million prostitutes walking their streets. 2.8 million women who prefer to be prostitutes, even though they had the choice, if they like, to be mothers or wives. But they choose to be prostitutes because there are more than 10 million men who prefer them also to be prostitutes because that's their clients. They are also paying for it because every single day in the Western world, 350 young children are snatched off of the streets and put into some kind of place where they'll be used for child fornic uh, prostitution. Every day, 350 children disappear and used for child pedophiles, child prostitution. This is the Western world, the most developed world. Did you know that every single day, 357 people shoot themselves in the head, take some pills, slit their wrists, Every single day, they have no reason to live in the developed Western world. I can give you more and more and more statistics, but I think you understand that Allah is just. And the justice means they have to pay. And so Allah is making them pay. But... He has given them an alternative. He has put Muslims in their midst. He has given them Islam as a choice. And if the Western world will repent and look at Islam, they can change themselves, purify themselves, gain the repentance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, become Muslims, and Islam will solve the problems which they have. Muslims should not themselves become depressed because it's your fault. If you sit in front of the television watching Al Jazeera four or five hours every day, you will be nothing but depressed. Because just for you to know this, that Time Warner owns a major share of Al Jazeera. Time Warner owns a major share of Al Jazeera or provides them with programming and their phenomena of coming to the Muslim world during the Persian Gulf War, they didn't just pop up, they were propped up. They didn't just pop up, they were propped up because Time Warner understood that the Muslims needed their own CNN in the Arabic language, with their own images, with their own entertainment, to see the rape, the murder, the statistics, the occupation, the sins, the depression, the images. And they said to themselves, why don't we let them enjoy themselves and be depressed at the same time? So we are bombarded with this idea of suicide bombers. And let's distinguish this issue. They are called suicide bombers because to call them other than that would be to justify, would be to amplify, would be to explain why they do what they do. But if we say they committed suicide, it means that they are pathetic. 
And for us Muslims, it also means they have to be criminals. So if they are pathetic, and if they are criminals, we cast them off. We write them off, we say. But did any one of you visit the family of anyone who was called a suicide bomber? Did you go to Palestine? Did you go to Shishan? Did you go to Afghanistan? Did you go to Kashmir? Did you go to, uh, to uh, Somalia? Did you go to anywhere, Syria or Iraq or Jordan? Did you go to Lebanon? Did you listen to the families of those people? And did those families say that their sons or their daughters committed suicide? Not one family will ever say that their son or daughter committed suicide. So who is calling them suicide bombers? Did they write a letter and say, I'm committing suicide? No. You and I are being told that they are suicide bombers, and we are swallowing it and calling them that. I am not justifying what they do. And for the most part, Islam doesn't support what they do. I mean, that is not the manner of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now whoever disagrees, you have the right to disagree. We have the authentic books of the seerah, of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in that, let us go and look and see if any companions, if any tabi'een, any atba tabi'een, if they themselves, they went someplace, blow themselves up on a bus, or a hospital, or a population, or a school, or a road in the middle of civilization or some people, just as an act of reprisal, blow themselves up, or whatever, did they do that? Never. Never. However, if you push some people to an extent in which they become frustrated to the point where between anger and frustration they almost lose their mind. When you push an individual to a certain point, they are between, almost they are insane. And the Prophet them, told us, a man came and asked for advice and the Prophet them, told him what? La taqdab. La taqdab. La taqdab. Don't be angry. Don't get angry. Don't be angry. He said, don't you see when you're angry what it does to the face? Don't you see what it does? Don't you see the fire coming up? Don't you see the shaitan coming? So when a man becomes angry, a woman becomes angry, they may kill themselves, they may kill someone else, and after that they will be sorry because it's an act of frustration. Now those people who have pushed, been pushed to a point where they've been dealt with like animals, their families have been killed, their sons, their mothers, their daughters, they have no homes, there are no schools, no hospitals, no food, no services, no dignity, no honor, no nothing to live for. And they've been pushed to a point, Allahu A'lam, about their intentions and what they do. If someone came inside your home, you came home and you found someone in your home, and they, you asked them why you're here, you said, because in the scripture that God gave to me, he said, that this house here belonged to me. You would say, no, get out of my house. So they kill your father, they kill your brother, they kill your uncle, they kill everybody except the children. And they stay in that house. And those children they did not kill, even though they cannot get back in the house again. Every time those children pass by that house, they pick up a stone and they throw it at that house. And those people in the house, they shoot at those children. I would ask you, are those children criminals? If they came, if those children, if that's all they could do was throw a rock at those people that took your house, would those children be criminals? The person said, no, 
That's a very pathetic situation. I said, that is the condition of Palestine. There's nothing but children throwing stones, <coughs> facing tanks. But that's all they can do. And I say, that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only gives to the children of Palestine rocks to throw and the heart to face tanks, they must face the tanks and they must continue to throw stones. Because that is an act of honor. And if the men, if there are no more men to throw stones, to carry the honor of those people, then the children, they must continue to throw stones until there is no one else to throw a stone. Those Muslims who are in the Muslim lands, Palestine, Kashmir, Shishan, Somalia, Algeria, Afghanistan, Philippines, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and at the present situation in occupied Iraq, these are people who are engaged as freedom fighters. They are freedom fighters. We don't say about their aqidah. We don't say they are completely right. We don't say we ag agree with everything they do, but they are freedom fighters. But they are called what? Fanatics, extremists, terrorists. But look at the history of Australia. Look at the history of America. Look at the history of Great Britain. Look at the history of France. Their history is full of glorified stories about people who defended their country as what? Freedom fighters. <laughs> freedom fighters. Because the whole idea of freedom fighters is something that is glorified. It is honorable to defend your country, except if you're Muslim. The Muslim is not supposed to defend his country. The Muslim is supposed to just get out, walk away, live like a dog, be humiliated, allow his wife to be slaughtered, or uh, to be raped. The Muslim is supposed to accept this. If you accept it, then you're a good Muslim. But other people in the world, they don't accept it, and they resist it, and they're called what? Freedom fighters. Now, I do not justify, and I have no connections, and I do not promote in any way people who execute acts of political reprisals. And in many cases, frustrated Muslims have, in fact, acted as terrorists. We have to admit that, that some Muslims carried out what they call political acts of reprisals, they have in fact executed terrorism. But on what scale? How many million did we say? Over 200 years? 487 million. So I say, those Muslims in those places who have carried out individual acts of political reprisals that would define them as terrorists, how many million have they killed? Have they even killed a million? In the last 30 years? No, I'll tell you. If you go to the archives of all the uh, newspapers for the last 20 years, you'll not find even 45,000 people who have been killed by so-called terrorists. Now you add 45,000, to 487 million. And there we have the equation of terrorism. Now, what is the history of this condition, Muslims? I'll give you the history quickly. One, the history of this frustration that forces Muslims, that have forced certain Muslims to act in this way. One, protracted colonialism. Number two, after the colonialism, repression and tyranny by the post-colonialist appointed puppets, leaders of Muslim countries, who themselves accepted the bribes to repress their people 
and to fill their own pockets. Political domination and economic exploitation, incursion and occupation of the Muslim lands, systematic assassination and imprisonment of the Muslim scholars and inspirational activists, suppression of religion and categorical condemnation and indictment against the Islamic movement. This is the history behind this frustration. Now, what can we do? What can we do as Muslims? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said in the Quran, we Muslims must make ta'awan. We must make ta'awan on this issue. We have to. If a Muslim is placed in prison and there is no evidence that we have seen, we have to support him or her. We cannot say, he must have done something wrong. She must have done something wrong because then we can go to sleep and eat our own food and enjoy ourselves and forget that Muslim. No, we have to say, they must be innocent because the rule, even in the Western world, is that a person is innocent until what? Proven guilty. So if a Muslim is taken from their home or off of the street and they are held for suspicion of anything, we Muslims have to feel like our finger has been cut off. Like someone has stepped upon our chest, like someone has snatched our son or our daughter and we will be at the police station. We will be calling, we will be asking, we will be asking and crying and begging, and the least we will do is to get a lawyer. But because it's not our son, because it's not our daughter, and we don't have to see them physically, we say nothing. Oh Muslims, are we guilty just because we're Muslim? And what will you wait? Will you wait until you wake up one morning and a knock comes to your door and you are pulled out of your house and separated from your wife and your children and then you are put inside the prisons. And Muslims, will you wait until thousands of you, because it can happen at any time, you say, not in Australia, not in America, not in Great Britain, not in the home of the free, the land, not in the home of the brave and the land of the free, not in the land of democracy, not in the land of individual dignity. This cannot happen. It is happening. It is happening right in front of you. But because it's only happening one by one by one by one, and you have to go to work in the morning. And you have to take care of your own business. And you have to mind your business. That brother or sister, may Allah help them, inshallah. And we go about our business. It will be your son. It will be your grandson. It will be you. It will be Khalid. You will hear about it. Maybe Khalid will be stopped. And Khalid will be put in the prison. And you will say, Oh, what did he do? And then what you will do? MashaAllah, SubhanAllah, shake your head and Khalid is forgotten. You say, no brother, we would not do that. But this is what you're doing and this is what we are doing. We have to support a Muslim. The Prophet said, a Muslim is the brother of a Muslim and he never leaves him to be oppressed by another Muslim. We have to spend our money, we have to spend our time, we have to raise our voice, we have to spend some energy, we have to lose some night's sleep, we have to make some phone calls, we have to sign something, we have to ask something, what can I do? So that when you go to sleep at night, you can say to yourself, Oh Allah, I did something, oh Allah, I tried.
I spent my money. Oh Allah, I sold something. Oh Allah, I did. I went called a lawyer. Oh Allah, I stood up outside that court. Oh Allah, I went there. Oh Allah, I called about that brother. I wrote letters. Oh Allah, I took care of their family. Oh Allah, I did something. And oh Allah, but I didn't do enough. Oh Allah, you forgive me. And we're not talking about Pakistani Muslims supporting Pakistani prisoner. We're not talking about Somali Muslims looking into the life or what has happened to a Somali Muslim. We're not talking about an Arab Muslim, Lebanese Muslim looking to the affairs of a Lebanese prisoner. We're talking about a Muslim looking into the condition of his Muslim brother. What the Prophet said, La yu'minu ahadukum hatta yuhibba li akhihi ma yuhibbu li nafsi. La yu'min, he said. You're not a Muslim, not a real Muslim, if you don't love for your brother, what you love for yourself. You love freedom, you love your home, you love to eat your own food, you love to look at your children at night, you love to be with your wife, you love to move around to say what you want to say, you like peaceful tranquility, you like your life to be continued, you like to be away from... If you'd like that for yourself, how we go to sleep and not support our brothers. Secondly, Muslims, we have to make ribat. What this means? It means be patient with a tremendous amount of patience and tolerance, but also gather yourselves together, bind yourselves together, collect your resources, your material resources, your spiritual resources. Be behind a leader of Muslims. Put your money together. Put it in a trust together. Live together. Around your masjids. Form your communities. Do what all other people are doing. Love each other. Protect each other. Live next to each other. Support each other. Swear by each other. Live, support, and die for each other. Because if you don't do it, you will fade away and Allah will replace you with another people. And as we sit here today, brothers, I want you to know this. The Muslims are being replaced as you sit here today. Between Australia and Great Britain and North America, 118 thousand people are accepting Islam every year. 118,000 people are accepting Islam every year. Double the amount which was accepting Islam before September 11th. Before September 11th, about 62,000 people was accepting Islam between North America and Europe and uh, UK, UK and Australia. After September the 11th, that number has went up to on an average of 118,000. What is the reason? It is not because Muslims are giving more da'wah. It's because Allah has opened the window and that window will never be closed again. We don't say that we like or we support September 11th. No Muslim would say that in his right mind. Even though I don't believe any Muslim had something to do with that. I want to go on record to tell the Muslims don't take the rap for that. If some Muslims were involved, they were not the ones who really executed and orchestrated that action. There is clear evidence now to show that Muslims could never have orchestrated that kind of action. But if some Muslims was involved at all, they were compromised and it was orchestrated and carried out by a rogue operation.
Nevertheless, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fa'alun lima yuri. He is the doer of whatever he wants to do. And to send signs and ripples through the heavens and the earth. And after September the 11th, the window to Islam has been opened wider than it has ever been opened and it will never close again. And when we talk about media, this is the last thing I want to say to you. We have been assaulted by the media. We have been slandered by the media. We have been put in prison in our own homes by the media. We have been traumatized by the media and there's nothing we can do about it because we have no media of our own. Well, brothers and sisters, that time has changed. Alhamdulillah, I'm telling you now that in August we are breaking the ground, alhamdulillah, not for a channel. A year and a half we were here in Australia talking about a channel, is it, Sheikh? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sometime when you ask for something, be careful. Because you ask for a cup and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gives you a river. We are breaking the ground for the Islamic Broadcast Center, which will have and host 50 channels. We will break the ground for it, our own building. And we will host 50 channels and five FM radio stations. And therefore, we would be able to offer, the Islamic Broadcast Corporation would be able to offer any Muslims from in the world who want us to host their signal based on our mission statement, 50 satellite channels. In the meantime, have sabr. Don't be angry. Don't be foolish. Don't be criminals. Don't be reactionaries. Don't talk like a fool. Tell your sons, your young, angry sons, tell them, cool down. Take it easy. Don't get caught in the trap of reactionism. We don't need to be reactionaries. We Muslims need to be proactive. Study your enemy. Study yourself. Read Quran. Understand the Quran. Understand the manner of the Prophet ﷺ. There was a program on the television in the UK where a Muslim from Europe was talking with his father. And his father said to him, son, listen, I don't mind you to be a Muslim, if that's what you want to do. But why do you have to wear all of those funny kinds of clothes? Why do you have to wear this beard? Why do you have to do this and do so? The son said to him, listen, father, I don't tell you how to dress. This dress I'm wearing is the dress of the Prophet wasallam, And I love him. And I'm wearing lihya because the Prophet wasallam, he used to wear it and I love it. And I'm a Muslim and I love Islam and I love Islam more father than I love you. He's talking on the television. So his father said to him, okay, but if you want to do that, why are you telling me that you want to go and move from here and go to Syria or Pakistan or go and live in uh, Jordan or you want to live in Saudi Arabia? Why do you want to do that? The son said, because I want to save my children from the fitna of this land which we are living in. And what did the father say to his son? Subhanallah. He said, son, don't you see? You don't have to go any place soon. The land where we are living at will all be Muslim. A non-Muslim father said that to his son. This was his observation that the way things are going, his father said, you don't have to move anywhere. Soon, Islam will become the dominant religion anyway. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره الكافرون ولو كره المشركون ولو كره المنافقون الله has spoken the truth and his messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم هو الصادق المصدوق he has spoken the truth O oh, Muslims we are fortunate to be Muslims in this time we are fortunate to be Muslims under these times and circumstances and Allah is going to ask us about what he has given us and the responsibility he has placed in our hands وَأَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَأَسْتَقْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ يَا اللَّهُ غَفُرُ الرَّحِيمُ بِرَحْمَتِكِ يَا أَرْحَمَ الرَّحِيمِينَ سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُمْ وَبِحَمْدِكُ وَنَشَادُ وَلَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتِ وَنَسْتَغْفِرُكُ وَنَتُوبُ إِلَيْكِ